Chapter 5 Understating Cola While my father was larger than life and one of the hardest working people I have ever known, my mother may have been fiercer still, the real keystone of our family. Lois Tublin was born and raised in Baltimore. At 21, she met my dad on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and a few years later they married. She had four children in seven years. I came along third after a son and a daughter before a second daughter. My mother spent her years making life better for the rest of us, and one of her greatest assets was her unrelenting optimism. When we were frightened as kids because of thunder and lightning, my mother would say, I see the sun about to come out. I carry on with her ability to look on the bright side. When I step up to the tee to start a round of golf, I know sand traps and lakes and other hazards are lurking on the course, but I ignore them, refuse to look at them. Recognizing them and talking about them is a sure bet I will end up in them. My mother also taught me one of the most important lessons in investing, one that everybody should know one that would underscore just how bad a job Wall Street does in managing people's money. I am talking about inflation. I prefer to think of it as cost of living adjustment, or COLA, and you will see why in a moment. By COLA, my meaning is the increase in the cost of living that infects and affects our daily lives. Of the eight kinds of risk we mapped out in Chapter 3, Inflation risk may be the most devious, dangerous, and difficult to diagnose. Given enough time, it can erode the real value of a retirement fund even more than stock market losses. Yet the most respected names on Wall Street, Morgan Stanley among them, do little to train their sales forces to be on the lookout for inflation as part of their strategy for portfolio construction— or to offer ways to help offset its deleterious effects on client wealth. Most people know inflation as a matter of how much prices are rising as tracked by the Consumer Price Index, CPI, issued by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics. The CPI uses a theoretical basket of products, goods, and services, some 80,000 different things, to tote up how much they currently cost compared with how much they cost last month and last year. If you believe the CPI, inflation in the U.S. has been running at 2% annually since 2008. Are you seeing that in your life? Doubtful. My guess is 7% a year would be more accurate for many of us. In Dallas, where I live and work, the cost of living is rising at 9% a year. Given this gap between the CPI and the real rise in your cost of living, you should assume that your personal inflation rate is double or triple the CPI and ensure, if possible, that your portfolio can grow at that higher rate or better. Most Wall Street houses fail to take into account actual price increases in the client's own life. This is why my chip score method is so critical to smart investing— it may be the only financial evaluation regimen in the world to take into account an investor's personal cola when figuring out whether his portfolio can earn enough to let him stay at par in purchasing power. The CPI forms the basis for a trillion dollars a year in government benefits paid to more than 60 million Social Security recipients, and when the CPI goes up, the government bumps up their payments commensurately. Thus, the government and other parties have an interest in understating the real rate of inflation to hold down future benefit payments. We will tackle that topic in the next chapter. My keener awareness of the risks of inflation came to me belatedly seven years into my career as an advisor when I visited my mother for one of the last times before she passed away. It was February 1994, and my mother had divorced my father and was living on her own in Chappaqua, fighting lung cancer, and unaware she had only a few months left to live. The cancer had spread to her brain, though she did not yet know it. I had been flying from Dallas to New York most weekends to see her as she endured chemotherapy and its devastating effects. On February 12th, my 32nd birthday, I wanted to spend it with my mother as it might be the last one we would celebrate. 
At the airport in Dallas, I learned the Northeast was gripped in an epic snowstorm, the biggest in fifteen years. I told the gate agent I was trying to spend my birthday with my ill mother and asked him to get me any flight in that direction. Please. He got me to Chicago, where I searched for a connecting flight to New York and repeated my story to an American Airlines agent who told me, there's not a chance in the world anything's going to open up. Two hours later, out of nowhere, I heard my name over the PA speakers. I showed up at the gate and an agent in a last-second rush skipped any ticketing and told me, just get on the plane. It was a flight to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, another step closer. When we landed, I grabbed my carry-on Morgan Stanley and Company bag and started hitchhiking. The snowstorm was still blowing hard, the roads were icy and slick, but finally a trucker picked me up. I just came right out with it. It's my birthday. I'm trying to get to my mom to celebrate it with her because it may be our last one. She has lung cancer. She's in Chappaqua. Now on a mission of mercy, the trucker got on his CB radio and recruited other truckers to join him in an amazing feat of kindness. They set up a kind of relay race with me as their baton. The first trucker drove with me for several hours before handing me off to the next one, who kindly took me with him on his route as far as he could and then dropped me off for the next driver, who already was there and waiting for my arrival. This went on for what may have been a total of seven trucks, seven kind strangers, men who had no reason to help me other than the goodness and generosity in their hearts. It was late afternoon by the time I showed up on Mom's doorstep. The last time I had seen her, she was especially frail. The chemo had made her lose most of her hair, which I had expected, but it also seemed to have drained some of her obstinate spirit, consumed some vibrant part of her. This had surprised and shocked me. I worried what I might find this time. I knocked. No answer. The front door always was unlocked, so I went in. She had bought the condo after the divorce when I was still in college. Half a house, she called it. I looked around, but she was nowhere to be seen. This worried me. The snowfall had made the roads especially dicey, and my mom should not be out and about driving around in this mess. This was well before cell phones, remember, so I borrowed a car and started driving around looking for her, visiting neighbors in the hospital. She had developed an obsession with crusty, toasted Thomas English muffins, so I stopped in grocery stores, too. Maybe she was out for an emergency pickup. Where the hell have you been? I returned to her home, unsuccessful, and sat down to wait, hoping she was okay. Finally, around 7 p.m., Mom walked in, barely surprised to see me. Where the hell have you been? I asked her. Mom, your fucking father didn't adjust my alimony for cola. I blurted out, Mom, you drink tab. And she said, No, my cost of living adjustment. Now puzzled, I asked, What is that? And she shamed me. Edward, you don't know what a cola is? How could you not know that? Clearly, despite the chemo, she still had plenty of grit and backbone left. And man, oh man, my mom was so right. How could I have been so clueless on cola? Working on Wall Street for seven years by this time, I should have been fluent in inflation and colas and the whole bit. And yet I had no idea what a cola was. And it wasn't front and center for anyone else in the business either. That gnawed at me. My mother was losing purchasing power and feeling the effects of it every day. So much so that recently she had taken a new job to bring in more income, working in sales at Saks Fifth Avenue in White Plains, New York, without telling any of her family. Even more stubbornly, she had insisted on heading out into the blinding snowstorm to make it to work that day, even though twenty-one inches of snow would fall on the area. That night, she was returning home from a full day at the sax counter. Think about that. My mother, after being a homemaker for thirty years, had taken a job to fight the effects of inflation, 
even though she was fifty-seven years old and wore a wig to hide the effects of chemo. She still went out there every day and took care of things on her own. True grit. I wish she would have asked me for a little help, but that just wasn't her way. When clients are behind in retirement savings and ask me what they can do to catch up, some will balk when I advise taking a second or even a third job. My own mother got a job while battling cancer. Don't tell me it can't be done. My mother passed two months later. It hit me hard and still hurts. Soon after, it occurred to me that, while she had died before inflation could lay waste to an even bigger chunk of her life savings, what about millions of retirees who live far longer? What will happen to their accounts? Devastation may be the answer for many of them, even those with blue-chip branded wealth advisors. From that moment forward, whenever I thought about how clueless Wall Street was on cola and risk, I would recall the frightened look on my mom's face as she asked me to reassure her. Am I okay? Is this going to be all right? Nobody should have to feel that insecure and vulnerable. I vowed to find a better answer, and as I began to develop the chip score, she was always at the forefront of my mind. There were many other Lois's in the world, just as frightened as my mother, not knowing what they should do and being led astray by an industry that pretended it could help them. In the ensuing years, I researched inflation and pored over academic studies and articles on the real increase in the cost of living. The research on the late pollster Albert Sinlinger, who claimed to have coined the term consumer confidence, surprised and alarmed me. He had asked consumers the same four questions about their economic outlook every year since 1955, compiling a household money supply index that measured household liquidity. A New York Times profile of Singlinger, published a year before my mother's death, said, One striking result of his polling is that consumers almost invariably find inflation higher than is shown by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. His own cost of living index now shows an annual rate of increase of about 8.25%, after being between 9 and 10% much of the year. These rates are three to five times the increases shown by the Labor Department's Consumer Price Index. My research also led me to economist Walter J. John Williams and his website on CPI chicanery and inflation, shadowstats.com. He has said the intentional skewing of CPI has deprived Social Security recipients of fully half of what they otherwise would be receiving if their COLA increases matched the real rise in prices that has been going on for 20 or 30 years. A couple of years after I left Morgan Stanley, I opened my own firm, Chapwood Investments. A few months in, I reached out to Williams to ask about his research, and we struck up a correspondence. We have chatted a few dozen times in the ensuing years, mostly by phone. Early on, I brought up the need for separate COLA indexes, depending on location. Costs in New York City rise 10% a year, but go up only 3% in Taos, New Mexico. The biggest reason for that difference is taxes. Taxflation, as I called it. Higher taxes in New York create higher prices for everything, and the bite they take out of people's pockets adds up over the years. So do the lost opportunities, in terms of what other necessities that money might have purchased if it hadn't been collected in taxes. Yet the government's CPI doesn't take into account the differences in state and local tax rates in various places and their impact on spending behavior, just as it gives short shrift to another big factor in your personal cost of living, the high costs of health care. Toward this end, I lobbied Williams to do a thorough city-by-city -city survey of real prices. Mr. Williams, I told him, you need to do COLA per city. You are missing a really important element, taxflation. Taxes are the number one reason costs go up for consumers. Eddie, you are absolutely right, but I don't have time to do it, he responded. It was just too much extra hassle, he told me, and I thought, well, I guess I'll do it.
My plan was to gather the shifting prices for 500 of the most frequently purchased products in the top 50 markets in the country. After I assembled the list of cities, I checked it against my friend list on Facebook and found I had a pal in every market except two, Wichita, Kansas, and Taos, New Mexico. I reached out to the bunch of them, telling them of my interest in tracking prices. Most referred me to someone who would be more interested in taking part in my experiment. Our price index made its debut a few months later, and we named it the Chapwood Index. It included not only product prices, but also local average costs for personal taxes, health insurance, mortgage payments, and so on. Our index showed that in many markets, prices were increasing much faster than the CPI measured. In my hometown of Dallas, the Chapwood Index had prices rising 9.4%. In a lot of cities, the price of popcorn at the movie theater was spiking hard. The cost of a bagel was going up 15 cents in many places. That translates to an extra $55 a year for a bagel a day. We still update the Chapwood Index every six months to get a more realistic view of the true price movements in people's lives. Research elsewhere also underscored the corrosive effects of falling behind in purchasing power. U.S. bonds kept up with the rise in inflation only 17% of the time from 1997 through 2011, one article reported. If you earned 2% a year on a 10-year Treasury note until maturity, your return after taxes was only 1.3% at a 35% federal rate. Yet inflation averaged almost 3% in that same 15-year span. So you were down 25% or more in purchasing power by the end of that period. By contrast, stock prices can rise with inflation because companies often possess pricing power in an inflationary cycle, boosting their reported earnings. From 1926 to 2011, the S&P 500 returned almost 10% a year, seven points better than the inflation rate for consumer prices in that same period, according to data from the financial research firm Ibertson Associates. A Larcenous Villain Money manager David Dreeman of the Value Index Fund has called inflation a larcenous villain. He pointed out in early 2015 that 30-year Treasury bonds yielded 2.82%, and would net only 0.75% annually after accounting for 2% inflation and taxes. If inflation increases to 4%, it will have a disastrous effect on safe money savers, he writes. Indeed, this strategy wiped out a good part of the financially conservative wealthy after World War II, as the dollar lost 92% of its purchasing power from 1945 to the present time. How devastating. I read that and felt absolutely shocked. Though few people on Wall Street seem to pay attention to inflation and its pernicious effects, you can reconstruct your portfolio to anticipate and offset it by using my chip score system. All you need to do is read the rest of this book. But first, young Jedi, you must understand more about the invisible and visible forces of inflation and cola. Inflation is everywhere and all around us, like the Force in Star Wars. Monthly rents are up overall by more than 70% from 2000 to 2018. That is up an average of more than 3% a year, which is almost 50% higher than the rate of inflation reflected in the CPI overall, which rose only 2.09% annually in the same period. Cell phones, streaming services, and Internet access have added hundreds of dollars a month to each person's tab, expenses that didn't exist 20 years ago. The starting price of a weekend family package at Disney World has doubled in 10 years, now up to almost $2,800. Movie theaters now charge an average of almost 10 bucks a head, up 30% in a decade. In New York, the ticket price can be as high as $17. The average monthly cable bill now is at $100, and for years it has been rising at three or four times the rate of inflation. Pay-per-view movies at home cost the cable company pennies to deliver, 
but cost viewers $6 a pop. And though tech costs fall 15% to 30% a year overall, the movie price holds firm or rises. To be sure, the CPI may overstate rather than understate some elements of inflation by failing to account for falling costs elsewhere. Advances in technology and declining costs per unit of computing power can be difficult to trace and assess. Example, storage costs fall 30% to 40% per year, encouraging some big companies to make even larger purchases, so much so that they end up spending more than they were spending before. Should that count as deflationary or inflationary? Though the media lament slack wage increases and declining purchasing power for American consumers, they fail to talk about how many items are far cheaper than they were 20 or 30 years ago, in terms of how many days of work at average wages it takes to pay for a particular appliance at current prices. Some examples from a recent article that culled prices from the old Sears catalog in 1975 and compared them with prices nowadays— In 1975, when worker wages averaged $4.87 per hour, you had to work 60 hours to buy a 19-inch color TV set. In 2013, when worker wages neared $20 per hour, a similar TV set required less than seven hours of work. We went from seven and a half days of labor to less than one day. Buying a refrigerator took almost 68 hours of work in 1975, compared with 20 hours in 2013. A washer-dryer required 68 hours of labor back then, and it took only 30 hours of work in 2013. Or, looked at another way, in 1970, the cost of a washing machine was equal to 8% of average annual earnings, and by 2011, the cost was just 1.5% of average annual wages. These changes in prices result from efficiencies of mass production, cheaper manufacturing offshore, leaner back-office operations, and better targeted marketing. It is questionable how good a job the CPI does at ingesting those and other variables as it spins out the official version of what is happening to prices in the economy. This is true no matter how great the minds at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Rising prices, however, are only a symptom of inflation. Technically speaking, inflation is an increase in the supply of money available to chase after goods. It is better known for the increasing prices that are a byproduct of inflation. Say you do business in an especially small, sealed-off economy where only a million one-dollar bills are in circulation for all commerce, and everything is priced accordingly. Now, let's say you suddenly print another million one-dollar bills and put them into circulation. This inflation of the money supply will let more people seek a raise or impose higher prices. By doubling the supply of one-dollar bills in your teensy economy, however, you also reduce the value of each dollar by half, because when the supply of anything soars, the value per unit goes down accordingly. The law of supply and demand writ small. The real problem emerges when everyone inside this sealed microeconomy begins to expect prices to rise, because this expectation changes their behavior. They start buying bigger supplies of a given thing now to avoid paying more later. This psychological shift fuels even higher prices, creating a destructive, self-sustaining cycle. Now, let's zoom out to the massive $19 trillion a year U.S. economy, still the world's largest by far. China is number two at $11 trillion. This cycle, in part, is how we got to double-digit inflation during the back half of the 70s and the administration of President Jimmy Carter— To tame this roaring, destructive dragon, the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, raised interest rates to a suffocating high of 14.8% in 1980. At the time, the Misery Index, developed by economist Arthur Oaken, became a household phrase that helped Ronald Reagan wrest the presidency from Carter in 1980, 
the misery index is equal to the inflation rate plus the unemployment rate. And during the Carter presidency, it hit a high of 19.9. Under President Reagan, the index hit a low of 7.7 by December 1986. The December 2018 misery index was even lower, at 5.8. The misery index. Imagine what it is like to have created something that has significant meaning and utility for the financial world. To be a wee bit grandiose about it, my dream is that the chip score catches on that way, helping millions of people avoid financial anorexia by giving them a clear grading system for vetting their advisors and forcing them to improve their services. The Fed plays a central role in the economy, even more so now after the market meltdown and the shock and all government bailout of 19 Wall Street banks a decade ago. The Fed sets key base interest rates on major banks' overnight lending to one another as the foundation for all other interest rates, and it controls how much credit is created for the banking system. Thus, the Fed is said to control the money supply, although the Treasury Department controls the printing presses and designates how much currency is in circulation. The Federal Reserve tightens and loosens its grip on these two choke points, interest rates, money supply, as it serves its mandate, consisting of three goals, attaining and sustaining full employment, or as close to it as possible, keeping prices stable, restraining inflation to a target of 2% per year, Maintaining Moderate Long-Term Interest Rates Game of Expectations The most important of these three goals may be stable prices and the expectation of stable prices on the part of consumers and the markets. A sudden outbreak of inflation can spread quickly through the economy, surprising businesses and investors and undermining the other two goals full employment, and moderate interest rates. To Fed officials, it's all a head game. To them, the most important factor is how consumers are feeling about inflation. Never mind what's happening to prices or the spending patterns of people right now. The pivot point is, what might they do next? Are their expectations changing, becoming unmoored in Fed speak, for where prices are headed? If they begin to anticipate higher prices, prices will rise, and inflation will get worse, in part simply because we expected that to happen. Like standing at the golf tee and focusing too much on the sand trap. Thus, the Fed endeavors to preempt mere expectations of rising prices, an even more elusive goal than restraining prices themselves. Wall Street, for its part, watches the Fed's every move, hiccup, statement, answer, and sideways glance, and parses it for some new clue that inflation expectations are becoming unmoored, and thus the Fed may raise interest rates, crimping economic growth and hurting stock prices, and who knows what else. One of the biggest fears now dogging investors, the bearish and circumspect among them at any rate, is that rampant, uncontrollable inflation could break out again. The rather stunning fact is that this has yet to happen, when by some measures it should have happened. In the great meltdown of 2008, the once roaring U.S. housing market suddenly tumbled, a global recession took hold, a credit squeeze strangled lending and sparked a rise in defaults, and the Federal Reserve and government officials had to intervene aggressively to stem a worldwide panic. The Fed mounted an intentional, strategic, massive increase in U.S. currency and capital to prop up the economy. As the Federal Reserve moved boldly to stave off global economic collapse and a second Great Depression, it took extraordinary actions on two urgent fronts. It slashed base interest rates to almost zero, to encourage easier credit and lending, and it imposed a massive increase in the supply of freshly created dollars in the economy. To help keep interest rates low and boost the tepid rebound, the Fed spent more than $3 trillion, money it never really had, to buy U.S. Treasury bonds, real estate bonds whose prices had collapsed, and other securities. 
This policy was called quantitative easing, QE, a soothing phrase that sounded like a format for light FM radio. Overall, the QE program swelled the Fed's balance sheet of assets it owns from less than $1 trillion to $4.5 trillion, thereby quadrupling its balance sheet in a few years. The enormity of it is almost unfathomable. You are talking a surge of newly created money or credit equivalent to roughly 25% of U.S. gross domestic product, GDP. The Fed program was like one massive government bond Ponzi scheme. In essence, the Treasury printed up new bonds as a promise to pay. Hand us millions of dollars now, and we will pay you interest on it for a bond duration of anywhere from one month to 30 years, and pay you back the full original sum at the end of the bond's term. Treasury sold these bonds to Wall Street firms, which resold them to the Federal Reserve, and pocketed a tidy little profit of golden crumbs from Bonfire of the Vanities. May Tom Wolfe rest in peace. The Fed legally is prohibited from buying government bonds directly from the Treasury Department, so Wall Street acts as the middleman and skims a vig, the vigorish, just as mob bookies do on illegal sports betting. Since the Fed quadrupled the total size of the balance sheet, prices in the U.S. generally should have risen faster in response, at least somewhere, to absorb the surge in the supply of new dollars and capital coursing through the economy. Recall my example of the sealed $1 million microeconomy that suddenly has $2 million $1 bills in circulation. The currency should be worth less, have less purchasing power than when half as many copies of it were available. The surprise is that inflation, according to government numbers, has remained a mild pussycat rather than turn into a roaring dragon. In rebounding from the meltdown a decade ago, prices were restrained in part by the fact that the severe downturn had whacked business activity so hard that it slowed the velocity of money how many times it was changing hands in the economy. Slow velocity of money, however, cannot explain why inflation has stayed dormant all these years. A much bigger factor is at work in this surprising absence of an inflation breakout, and that is the design of the Consumer Price Index, which lowballs the real rise in prices. This is costing Americans billions of dollars in lost purchasing power and unpaid benefit increases, and the biggest sham and scandal of it all is that this is by design, by tacit government conspiracy, and just about everybody is in on it, Wall Street included. The whole world is out of whack, and one of the key metrics we use to track it, CPI, is even more out of whack. How wacky is that? You will see what I mean up next. 